Hi, I'm Caitlin Moon. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of English at Trinity College Dublin. And for my contribution to this conference on feminist medieval voices, I would like to talk about what I think is one of the most feminist medieval figures in medieval literature. And she's very near and dear to my heart, so I'm excited to talk to you today about the wife of Bath. Now, the wife of Bath is many times a wife, but never a mother. And she is one of the most in my opinion, she is the most interesting pilgrim in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And this is in part because of her voice, or as I'll explain, her two voices. You see, Chaucer crafts her most clear, I think most clearly, out of all of the pilgrims. And one of the reasons, one of the things I want to address in this talk is, you know, why that is. Why is it that her voice rings true or through the most clearly? Um, for those of you who don't know, she is one of the 24 pilgrims from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which was written between 1387 and 1400. And these tales, which are written in Middle English, are meant to be both entertaining and often didactic, as is the case with the wife of Bath. She is trying to teach a lesson. And this kind of formation of tales, this, I, would, I hesitate to call it a genre, but Chaucer is imitating an established pattern that is set down by Boccaccio in the Decameron, which is, you know, plague literature. Check that out if you're bored during quarantine. Um, but as in this case with the Decameron, these tales are a group of people who are put together for a set period of time that are supposed to be entertaining, educational. You are supposed to take something away from it as well as passing the time. So they're meant to be engaging for both the characters within the text as well as the audience. And the wife of Bath sticks out because she is one of the most earthy and colorful characters. She, her main focus in her prologue, when we are introduced to her in the general prologue and her tale, all focus on sex, her body, and what can be done with it. So Chaucer describes the wife of Bath in really great detail. And if you're not familiar with Chaucer, he does not really waste a lot of time developing his characters, but he does for the wife of Bath. And this creates a really interesting character and also the question of why do we know this much about her? So we get to know her better than we do the other pilgrims. We get to know her backstory and we get to know what she looks like, her physicality, and this is important for the construction of her voice and her tale and her, the message that she is trying to convey and what Chaucer is trying to convey through this female unusual voice. So the wife of Bath is described within the general prologue and her own prologue in these details that include like allusions to sex, sexuality, fecundity, such as her wide hips, the gap between her teeth, which was supposed to mean she was, you know, ready and willing. And the way she dresses also kind of flouts the convention that you would expect from a wife. She is dressed very flamboyantly. She almost flouts the sumptuary laws that had been recently put into effect. Well, somewhat recently, I'm a little off on that date. I should look that up. But the point is, she is loud. She is earthy. She is not what you would typically expect femininity to be expressed in a medieval literary work. She also, you know, comes into really stark contrast with the prioress and other female characters that are included in this work. So she's body, she's earthy, she's physical, and her body is essential to the development of her character. And it's largely the focus of her own prologue that comes right before her tale. And her body is really important because it allows for her social mobility. And that is something that is 
very recently developed with the burgeoning bourgeoisie that's just coming into play. And it also is the focus of her tail because her body allows for control over her life. And this is very unusual for the medieval period. And the moral of her tale also focuses on her body, essentially the sovereignty over one's body, the sovereignty, the control over one's destiny. So the wife of Bath has been the subject of many, you know, textbooks, articles related to gender studies because of the emphasis on her sexuality and her physicality. So in a chapter of my PhD in particular, which focuses on the loathly lady, I look at the wife of Bath's body through the lens of gender studies and disability studies. The wife of Bath is deaf. The wife of Bath is aging. And she is possibly infertile. So her body has also granted her a level of expertise that is unusual for a medieval woman. So this expertise is the subject of her own discourse in her prologue, as well as her tale. And mainly it's the relationship between sex and sovereignty. The wife of Bath tells a tale that we would not really expect. She is presented as being very earthy, very fun, very loud, very, you know, rough and ready and ready to go. But she tells a loathly lady tale. And she does this in an Arthurian setting, which is very highbrow. It's not what we, the audience, would expect to hear from her. We would expect to hear a fablio, which is, you know, focused on fun, sex, you know, have a good laugh at the end of it. But instead, she tells something that is innately didactic. So, and more than that, she, the Lovely Lady Tale has distinct Irish overtones with its connection to sovereignty. Because the Lovely Lady Tale, in general, is based on the 8th century Irish sovereignty myth, Nile of the Nine Hostages. And this trope is picked up by John Gower, it's, and then, well, it's a matter of who came first, the chicken or the egg, Geoffrey Chaucer. I believe that John Gower came first. Most scholars will agree with me on that. Um, but the trope we see in The Wife of Bath's Tale is tr rings true to this Irish sovereignty myth. And in the myth, a very ugly old woman is guarding a well. And several of the sons of the High King of Ireland are off on a hunt, and they need a drink of water. And they come across this little old lady sitting next to a well, and she goes, well, you can only have some water if you give me a kiss. And she's so ugly. Really, just... The original myth goes into great detail about her teeth, her mouth, her just her whole physical nature. And she is made out to just be repulsive and elderly. And only one of the young princes, the youngest, bastard half-brother to the rest of the boys agrees to give her a kiss well one of them also gives her a little peck but this guy takes her and satisfies her every whim and in this you know reenactment of irish kingship ritual um, she transforms into a beautiful, idealized goddess. She is the goddess of sovereignty. And because he has sat aside her, she grants him sovereignty over Ireland. And in The Wife of Bath's Tale, we see a very similar figure who does not have a name, but she is a loathly lady. And within the concept Within the tale itself, the concepts of sovereignty and nobility as a character trait that is accessible based on your behavior, how you treat the elderly, the disabled, the other, um, are the focus of her tale. And this is a rather unusual contribution by the body wife of Bath, because 
it's borrowed from the romance genre. It's, I mean, there are elements of the Fablio within this. They're like the mal marié, the badly married, the mismatched. But on the whole, it's read as an Arthurian romance. And it's still an unusual setting for this tale. Like the tropes that she uses are not what you would expect from a typical Arthurian romance. For example, a rapist knight. Well, the knight has raped a young woman. Again, like issues of sovereignty over one's body in a sexual manner. And he is brought forward to Guinevere. Well, she's not named in this tale, but King Arthur's queen and her ladies must decide what to do with them. And she says that he must come up with the answer to this question, what is it that all women want, or else he will be killed. And he travels and searches for this and asks for help. And everybody, eventually, he finds this little old woman seated in a wooded setting. And she agrees to give him the answer to this question if he'll marry her. And he, much to his chagrin, he does, and brings her back to the court and consummates their marriage. And after this, she transforms into a beautiful, idealized princess. And she tells him that he has a choice. He can choose to have her either fair and faithless or foul and faithful. Either she can be beautiful and not really an ideal wife figure, or she can be ugly and a perfect wife. And in doing so, Chaucer emphasizes something different from Gower with this choice by focusing on like the kind of the ethics, the behavior that comes with control over the physical body and the donation of sovereignty over her body because he tells her to make the choice herself breaks this and resolves this issue. And she can be both beautiful and faithful because she has been given control over her own body. Now, the themes of sovereignty and nobility, we've said previously, are odd things for the wife of Bath to discuss, but the question is, well, why is this so weird? And it provides a stark contrast between the wife of Bath's prologue, which is very earthy, based on the body and physicality and, you know, those sort of body, fun tones, Whereas the Lowly Lady Tale is rather highbrow in comparison to it. I mean, it is very elevated literature in comparison. So this has sparked a debate among scholars, like should the Wife of Bath had originally told Fablio, particularly um, the Shipman's Tale, I think it was. Um, but instead, I believe that Chaucer deliberately picked this tale for The Wife of Bath. It was deliberately crafted because of the two different voices. Um, as I explore in more depth in my chapter, I think that The Wife of Bath's two voices, her own voice within the prologue, and the voice that she uses to talk about the, to tell the lowly lady tale, to talk about, you know, didacticism and morality and stuff like that, are indicative of two different styles of conduct literature that are present at the time. And the lowly lady is always a didactic figure, but the wife of Bath takes this to a gendered area that has not yet been explored. Um, Chaucer is notorious for incorporating many different literary genres. We've talked about the Fablio, we've talked about the Arthurian romance. Um, I believe that in this instance he is borrowing from the genre of conduct literature. And this is a very popular genre in the medieval period, especially with the growing bourgeois class of which Chaucer was a member. And 
as you can imagine, it was heavily gendered. So there was male conduct literature, which was focused more on how to behave in society, how to be a productive male figure that was financially successful and God-fearing and a good husband, and the female conduct literature, which was based more on practical advice, how to be a good wife, how to run a house, how to, you know, be subservient in the role that you were assigned. And the most famous examples of conduct literature that survive today are how the wise man taught his son and how the good wife taught her daughter. And these were both written in Middle English as well. So essentially these were manuals, how to behave, etiquette books. And as you can imagine, the wife of Bath flouts all of them. She is exactly the figure that the good, the wise man warns his son about, and she is exactly the figure that the good wife warns her daughter not to be, because she is socially mobile, she is reasonably well educated, she quotes classical and biblical texts that give her authority to tell a didactic tale. So she has, Chaucer has created this figure, this voice that crosses a gender divide. And so because her prologue mirrors the practical lived advice pertaining to sex and marriage that focus on female, that is the focus of female conduct literature, but her tale with its focus on sovereignty and nobility reflect the more literate and intellectual aspects of male conduct literature. So by flouting gender conventions, Chaucer has created a very interesting figure, a very interesting feminist medieval voice. So thank you for listening to me ramble on and I hope that everybody is safe and well in these really scary times. I am not in Barbados, I am in the bustling metropolis of Elkton, Maryland and um, actually in a dentist's office, which is where I'm working at the moment. So thank you, and I hope that you stay safe and well.